it's being recorded, so don't shout out any swear words or anything, because this is going on YouTube. Yeah. So, <laughs> my classroom, I need my correction stick. Oh, God. My classroom, uh, a little different from some of your other classrooms, maybe a little different historically. Uh, I probably talked about this a little bit. You can always bring your own technology. For the most part, you guys are so polite and good with it. For the most part, you don't have to ask to break it out. There will be times when you'll know you can't get it out. Right? But it's just like anything else. Like There's times that I don't really have paper out. There's times that I can let you use a book and times where you can't use a book. So it's, it's, I just consider your technology, your toys, to be another tool. Make sure you bring it to class so you have an internet-capable device of any kind. You should get in the habit of bringing it every day. Make sure if it's your cell phone, make sure you have it in the off position. A, because this place is a bunker and it'll just eat your battery every second it's on and you're not using it. Even if it's on, but on silent. And also because if it goes off during like class, or even like right now, if your cell phone was like blah, 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 making you aware that you got a text message or something, I would have to confiscate that. There may or may not be times during the year where I will want you to be texting people, but I will make sure that those times are very clear. Does that make sense, everybody? Yes, no, maybe. Great. Now, we do a lot of moodling, so, you know, those of you who have been on the Moodle before. And, in case you haven't noticed, I use Twitter quite a bit. There's my Twitter handle again, in case you missed it. Make sure you follow the uh, Bio Homework Hotline hashtag, because that will have pretty much everything you need for the class. Mm. All right, blue light goes on. That means, that means go, computer, go. There it is. In addition that, it's a flipped classroom. Here is, you might want to write this on something, here is my YouTube channel. For those of you that would rather interact with it with YouTube, youtube.com slash, it's easy to remember, SC Patterson, MBHS. Somebody already spelled SC Patterson, but there's only one SC Patterson at Mount Vernon High School. It's this guy. So if you go to that, if you type that in your web browser, it'll take you right to my channel. And I pretty much have it like organized, like I've got like playlists of each unit. So if you're like, oh, I just want to watch all the videos ahead of time because they're so good, you can always watch them there. Especially the first few units are better organized than the last few units. There. There's that. Flip class. Now let's do that bell work. Let's start with number three. How do you watch videos on YouTube? Give me, give me a rundown. Let's say, let's say you had to explain to your grandma how to watch a video on YouTube. Give me, give me the rundown. Devin's feeling hungry. Devin, what do you got? Uh, you would have to type YouTube in like a search engine, and then once you get to YouTube, click on any video and hit YouTube and just start playing. Okay. Okay. Anybody want to add anything to that? Grandma's probably old, isn't she, Devin? Sure. How's, how's grandma? Hopefully, grandma doesn't watch this. How's grandma's vision? Pretty good. Pretty good? Yeah. Really? Yeah. My grandma can't see anything. <laughs> <laughs> like anything. And there's Kenny the best thing. Yeah. yeah, I mean, she does have glaucoma, so part of it's not. But even, even before the glaucoma, like, I mean, she'd be like, we we'll would be like, yeah, right here, Grandma. She'd be like, right where? And like, I'm pointing at her, Grandma. like, I don't see anything in there. God. Listen, Grandma. <laughs> write this down. Because these are some things, like, some people know these things, and but I'm always shocked at how many teenagers who consume hundreds of hours of content on YouTube, like, every week. That's right, hundreds of hours every week. Do the math on that somehow don't know about these features of YouTube. So how I usually try to do, I embed it in the Moodle page. Now in order for you to see the whole thing without like scroll bars being weird, this right here, that's 360p. That means it's 360 pixels wide. For those of you that are always wondering like, what 720p is, that's 720 pixels wide. Which is pretty low quality. See that's all grainy and crappy? Now if you're on like your cell phone and you're not on our Wi-Fi, which, by the way, if you're using your phone here, you should definitely get on our Wi-Fi to save your data. But if you're using your own data, like maybe you're at home, maybe you're on the bus, maybe you're in the car, then 360p, maybe you may be okay with the graininess because it'll use less of your data. But if you're on a, if you're on a Wi-Fi network, that's infinite data. Click that little, everybody see this gear right here? <coughs> Click that little gear and crank that bad boy up to the highest quality possible. 
Some of them are 720p, some of them are just crappy 480p, which you wouldn't think like us. Oh, it's, it's actually a lot better than 360. So put it on the highest depth you possibly can. I maybe, I don't know if I do 1020p, because that's going to load really slowly even on our T1. If you're at home, it's going to load like extra slow. And then, and then, see this little button right here? Make that thing full screen. Holy crap. Look, who can see these? Who can see these? I'm projecting this on a gigantic screen. I don't even know what city that is. What's that? Oh, you think so? Fernando. San Fernando, very different from San Francisco. Make that thing, look at this, full screen. Where is San Fernando? This is the difference between full screen, I don't know. Brazil. It's down here in Brazil, right? Yeah. Wait, this is the difference between not full screen 360p, this is full screen 720p. Lot, 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 lot easier to see, and especially if you're going through like, there'll be like text in here, things that you want to take down for notes. Right? You, you need to be, the better you can read that, the easier it is. Everybody with me here? Yes, no, maybe. The other thing you could do, you probably I'll go back one maybe somehow. I don't know. No, I don't. But there's there's also a button I wanted to hit before I put this one. It's watch on YouTube. So if it's inside the Moodle and you're trying to watch it on your phone, it's going to be like kind of janky. Hit that watch inside YouTube button. It's right in between the gear and the full screen button, and that'll take you right inside your YouTube app. Then that'll do like more of the like YouTube type. Channel five Everybody with me so far here? Yes, no, maybe? Yes. yes. Delicious. <laughs> so like I said, I do the flip classroom, which is, you know, we're going to attach all the desks to the ceiling and you'll all be upside down. Cool. Just a little bit on that, and then you can go on the YouTube. So if your parents are like, what do you mean flip classroom? This video is going to be on YouTube, so you can be like, here, watch this little part about it, and then you'll know. So, you know, you know how this goes. This is more, and this is why it's notice how you're not sitting like this, notice how you're sitting in tables. It's not just so, like, it makes it harder for some people to see me lecturing. It's actually so uh, you can do it, you can work together. I want the classroom to run more of a collaborative work environment where you guys can work in groups. You can do this on your own time. Videos range anywhere. That the longest video I think I've ever made that was not like, like the longest one I made for homework, I think, is like maybe 13 minutes. Now it's too long, I'm going to cut it up. But usually they, I try to shoot for like 6 to 10 minutes. 6 is perfect, they're usually around the 10 minute mark. Which already you're like, ah, oh, 10 minutes. It's 10 minutes. That replaces a 47 minute lecture. That gives me like 47 minutes of class time. I need this. What's really rough about that though is what's that mean? If you don't do your homework, what's that mean? If you don't do your homework, then what? This is where it would be like a little worksheet, maybe it's 15 points. You don't do the worksheet, like whatever. You scrawl it off during class while the teacher's rambling on, blah, blah, blah. It's, it becomes very difficult to pass if you don't watch the lectures. Why? Why do you think so? Yeah, unless you're like reading the textbook religiously, because I don't know why you'd ever do that. But yeah, this is the direct instruction. It's going to your homework is this, right? We, if you're absent from a day of class, would you not get the notes off of friends? Would you just sit there and be like, well, oh, I was absent that day, so I'll just miss all the test questions over that day. That's, that's fine with me. I'll throw, I'll throw a hissy fit when I get my quizzes back. Like, I was absent on Tuesday. It's unfair to expect me to know it by Friday. Does that ever work for any of you? If it is, I'm sorry, because that teacher is not doing you any favors. Right, you miss a day. You're expected to know that information anyway. You're expected to get the notes, copy them. But now you miss a day. You don't even have to miss a day. Like right now, we got we have people who are out there today. They can watch us on the Moodle on YouTube and easy. So basically, it puts it's, it's called front loading. You have to do things like your homework is going to be before the in class. Does that make sense? That's the biggest change. Normally, it's like you do the class thing first. Then your homework is like the follow-up to that, yes or yes. yes. So now it's different. Now it's before class is what comes first, and then in class is the follow-up. And then if you're feeling frisky, you can even go and like uh, outside of class, like get more information and go crazy and try to like out and everything and be like, no, uh, it's really like this with your
Really? Nothing? That's a hilarious joke. Double, double entendre. Yeah. Uh, 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 uh. yeah. This is sort of the model that I want to do with my class. Using the videos, we can explain, and we can, uh, yeah, we can explain. And then that means all this other stuff we get more time to do in class, even though they're just out of class. I guess you can explore any time. I'm going to stop here this morning. Kelly, what's up? Oh, you can find it. It's kind of like that. Yeah. 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 Good, now get ready for lecture part two. Coin you're putting yourself at a disadvantage, I'm going to tell you why. So here's, here's my sales pitch of why you guys should take notes. It is important. Now this is coming from a kid, like I, I was I was quite in the most part of this. like bio one, no notes. I missed a scene, I just sat there. Got it. Makes sense. Maybe there'd be a diagram, maybe I'd copy it down, but the most just, yeah, I got AP bio, I think I took 10 pages of notes the whole year in that class. Did you say that in the Yeah. Really? Yeah. For real? Is that weird? No. No, because she's awesome, so it's, it's good. Most of the teachers I had big problems with don't work here anymore. It's good, because I was going to have a professional problem with my hotel. So you want to take your notes because they're going to help you do better on the test. In fact, researchers have actually found that you will do better on tests. Any student, even Quentin, you do better on tests if you take notes. Across the board. Scientifically, statistically significant data has shown that when students take notes, they perform better on the tests. They perform better on the quizzes. Here's the reason why. You guys probably have like your friend, you know, every group has that like one friend who just always wants to quote movies all the time. Yeah, but they're usually wrong. And you just sit there and be like, no, that's, that's not how that line went at all. That's, that's not how that line went. Are you kidding me? That's not even close. Here's the deal. If I asked you, like tomorrow, if I asked you even later today, if I asked you to like go through the main points of this lecture, you could probably tell me 50% of the things. What's a, uh, just someone remind us, 50% on a test, Josh? Yeah, it's net. The best part is, though, of that 50%, usually only 30% of that 50% is correct. That's 30% of 50%, that's 15% of the actual content. Megan Porter, what is a 15% on a test? Yeah. Oh yeah, that's 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 not I don't even know if we can count that as an F. We might have to drop that down to like an I or something. That's <laughs> awful. It all has to do with how you learn. Your brain uh, learns in like a really cool way, and it all revolves around having memory. You actually have different types of memory. You have working memory. You're using working memory right now. When you see those letters, you don't have to think W O R. Your working memory holds them and then uses them to combine them into words. You don't have to remind yourself of the pencil in your hand, do you? Do you? No, your working memory has got that. Your working memory lasts at most about a second. Then you have your, come on, the mouse. Then you have your short term memory. On average, this spans from around 7 to 10 seconds, maybe a couple minutes. Like, if you really work to develop your short-term memory, there are exercises you can do that we won't get into now, but if you really work to develop your short-term memory, you can develop it out to maybe a couple minutes. So you put things in your short-term memory, you will remember them for a couple minutes. Great. How are you going to pass a quiz with short-term memory? Short-term memory loss. So that's where you can't put things in short-term memory. Now, the reason why that's bad is because you can't put it in where you're working memory, you can't get it in your short-term memory. You can't get it in your short-term memory, you can't transfer it over. <laughs> really? In your, all right. Taylor, go sit at the computer, and when you hear me click, I want you to click the mouse. Oh, nice! <laughs> no, no, don't do that, though. Sit over at the computer. Take your notes with right, Long-term memory. Long-term memory. Now, short-term memory lasts a few seconds to maybe a couple of minutes. If you're awesome, anybody want to tell me how long your long-term memory lasts? How long is your long-term memory? Put up those hands. Tell me what you think. Long-term memory. What do you think? Quinn, what do you say? Sixty years more. More. Daily, what do you say? Um, 80. 80 
years. For some of you, 80 years. For most of you, more. Forever. Forever. Unless you damage your brain somewhere, with like damages the part of your brain that is holding that information, your long -term, once you have it in your long-term memory, it never goes away, ever. 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 This is simultaneously the most awesome and frightening thing about the way your brain works. Let me give you, let me give you an example. Three years ago, when I was working at Joe Lynn in the summer, I worked in the patio door line. I cut like 20 foot pieces of plastic into like five to eight foot pieces of plastic. I put them in all these punches, punched all these holes, flipped them around to the other side, put them in this other thing, drilled holes, put crap in it, put it on a cart, push it down to some very, very large guy, put rebar inside of it and other stuff probably. This last summer I worked at Joe Lynn again, I was on the paint line. Totally different line. I haven't even thought about patio doors except for the one that I bought and put in my house. They had me go over to the patio door so I'd help them out. I still remembered how to do everything from three years ago. From three years ago, I still remember like exactly how to, like without even having to think about it, how to grab the piece, how to shove it in, like I didn't have to like, it won't go in, like how to get in, how to get it out. I was just as fast this summer as I was three years ago. It's crazy. So once it's in there, it doesn't leave. So how do you get, how do you convert from your short-term to long-term memory? It's this process called encoding. Oh, oh, sorry. That's okay. This process called encoding, and rehearsal is the only way to get in. Who plays an instrument? Who does music-y type things? Who does music-y type things? Let's go. Braden, what do you play? Guitar. Guitar? Nice. You practice your guitar, Braden? Yeah. Yeah, because that, that way you can be sweet at it, right? Yeah. Nice. Yeah, so you practice a guitar. That's rehearsal. It's that muscle memory. But really, muscle memory is just an application of your long-term memory. Once it's in your long-term memory, you will remember how to do it forever. I have not touched the cello, the cello from like fourth grade through like sophomore year of college. I have not touched it except for once. Like I haven't played it at all. So one time in the last eight years. I was 20, I was like, uh, maybe 21, seven years, the last time I played the show. I could pull it out right now, and I could play sonatas that I practiced that I knew how to play in high school. I could play them right now, almost as well as I could in high school. You give me new sheet music, it's going to be ugly. You give me stuff that I already rehearsed, stuff I already encoded in my long-term memory, it's going to be there forever. Here's the deal. You'll be sitting there, you're like, oh, I totally forgot this thing. No, you didn't. If it's in your long-term memory, you will not forget it. That's the way your long-term memory works. The overwhelming majority of the time when people feel like they've forgotten something, it's something that they were not able to convert, something they weren't able to get from their short-term into their long-term memory. So what's this have to do with taking notes? Jacob. Are you the one clicking that? Yeah, I got it. Oh, okay. Sometimes I got it, sometimes. What's this have to do with taking notes, Jacob? Because if you continue to rehearse or read over your notes, uh, it'll transfer over into your long-term memory and you'll know it. Right. right. The, the only way to get things out of your short-term memory into your long-term memory is rehearsal. It's going over it over and over. That's actually what studying is. You take your, the things that you want to know and you actively, you, you can't just like read them and be like, yeah, yeah, box, 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 now I remember box. You have to like sit there, you have to think about it, you have to continue to access those memories. Here's the weird thing about your long-term memory. It's always in there. Sometimes though the connection, like if I've got this, imagine my brain is this room. And let's say I've got some memory right where Victoria is. Your brain is constantly making connections to like other parts like the, the, back to Victoria, back to Victoria. But if, you don't, if I don't think about the memory where Victoria is very often, eventually I won't be able to find my way back to it. It's still in there, but I'll have a harder time finding my way back to it. That's like the small percentage of time that people forget stuff. And the only way to get it from here to there is practice. Here's the deal. When I say words, I'm speaking right now, yes, and you're hearing it, this is the coolest thing that I love about your brains. When I say words and you hear them, it forces your brain to think those words. It's like some kind of awesome mind control, isn't it? That's one time. Not enough to get in your long-term memory. When you're writing, like when you're writing a word, when people were writing this, the entire time that you were writing this, 
the way that your brain works is it was saying it to you over and over and over and over and over. So the entire time you're writing, like how long do you think it took you to write that sentence? Those of you that copied it down exactly, which looks like it's supposed to be. What? Like, like it's, but that's eight seconds of active rehearsal that your brain is doing. That you didn't even have to like force yourself to tediously do. See what I'm saying? When you write things down, even if you never look, even if you never look at these notes again, you'll remember it better than if you didn't write it down. Plus, you've got that written log, you've got exactly what happened in class. That's the point of taking notes. You need to talk about your notes taking because most of you guys take notes. Most of you guys take notes like this. And you get PowerPoints like this, and you click through it like this, and if the teacher goes too fast, you'll be like, I'll wait back up, but I'm not going to back up. Now look around, look around. Some of your classmates are writing this down. I see, I see. Some of you are no, stop, stop. Why would you write that? It's like a paragraph. Why would you do that? You even need to write that down? No! This is just my way of saying I'll make better PowerPoints than the rest of your teachers. Here's the problem. Most of you guys just, just blindly copy whatever. It appears on the screen, you write it on the paper. There it is on the screen, here it is on my paper. And this is probably one of the reasons why Quentin does pretty well without writing things on his paper. Because Quentin, how do you think they're list doing it listening to me if they're just writing all this stuff on the screen? Yeah, they're probably not listening very well. Right? You can't keep up with a lecture. If you're writing all that stuff down, you can't keep up. The average person can hear <coughs> around 200 to 300 words per minute. The fastest typist, like you're considered a very fast typist, if you do like 150 to 160 words per minute. Handwriting, you're probably in the double digits, honestly. Maybe 90 if you write really fast and sloppy. So if you've got stuff coming out of you, 300, 400 words per minute, you can write it 90 words per minute. <laughs> You're never going to keep up. There's no way. You have to be able to look at those things, but also you have to be able to write some things that I say, too. In addition to that, kids will write down all kinds of stuff they don't need, like information, jokes, stuff they already know. Why would you write down stuff you already know? It's already in your long-term memory. You don't need to write that. The whole point of taking notes is so that you have something that you can study later to shift information into your long-term memory. If it's already there, you don't need to try and put it in there yet. This one is what kills me. I used to do this all the time, like with my freshman science class. Like, I would troll the crap out of it. And, like, I would sit there, and it would be, like, the same slide. Like, five slides later, it would be the same slide. And you just see kids like, oh, write it down again. Write it down again. Like, come on. Don't do that. Let me show you some examples. These are things I've actually seen students write down. This came from a meteorology student. It was a junior. Why would you write? Why? That's not even worth the ink or lead or paper that it would take. You know that. Even if you're colorblind, you probably know that. The sky is blue. You don't need to write that down. Cells are important. Well, I would think so. You're made out of them. You don't need to write stuff like, like opinions. You know, if it's something that your teacher's getting like all oh, jacked about, like, oh, this is like the best thing ever. I wouldn't write best thing ever. i put like a little star and maybe a Mr. P likes this. Because then I know, I best know that, because if Mr. P likes it, it's probably going to be on the test. You don't need to write that. Genetics is the most important course of study for humanity. Arguably a true statement, not worth writing down your notes. What could you write instead if you want to remember that genetics is really important? You say genetics are important. I would do it shorter. Remember, you got to be able to keep up. Double digit words per minute versus triple digit words per minute. How can you keep up? How can you narrow that gap? You have to be like genetics with a star about it. Yep, genetics with a star about it. But here's some good ideas. These are some things you need to incorporate in your note taking skills. Now, listen, this is important for all of you because even Quentin will come to a time where he will need to have a good note taking system. We won't be able to rely on just hearing it and regurgitating it later. If you don't develop a system now, you're running the risk of becoming like my friend Jacqueline Sweeney. Freshman year college, she went to one of those fancy private schools. Like, not the, like, crappy private schools, like the, the <coughs> uniforms and the smart kids and the whatever. She was valedictorian of her fancy little private school and almost flunked out her first year at Alton. This high school did not challenge her enough. 
She had no idea how to take notes. She had no idea how to study. And really, really, they almost like, like she was like this close to being asked to not come back. Bad. That's why you need to, even if you don't, like even if you don't need to right now, you will need a system later. If you have a system that you figure out now, you won't have to worry about figuring it out later. You already have one that works. You see what I'm saying here? Yeah. So in your notes, you want to make sure that you always put the, uh, oh, don't look at that yet. Wait, wait, go back. You want to put the date on it. It's good because like even if you got your spiral ring binder, but let's say somebody like totally hip checks Edie in the hallway, their binder goes flying and pages get ripped out and fly everywhere. If they're all dated, super easy to put them back in order. So right now you should put the date. Always put the date. Put the date, date. 99 on your notes. If you're blowing through like two or three pages of notes, you do 991, 992, 993. And you could go crazy. You probably won't go through that many pages of notes. Additionally, be brief. Don't try to write everything. Being teenagers and having technology available that you have available, you all have a really awesome. I already went on this whole thing about notes. You have this really awesome abbreviation system already in place. Write with your hand just when you're doing notes. Write with your hand the same way you write with your thumbs. It'll save you a lot of time. Cursive is a lot faster than print too, so if you have the cursive, break that crap out. If you don't have the cursive though, don't, don't, don't do it. It'll be really mm -hmm. slow. You know, use all the abbreviations you can. Like, like this, you know, could mean different things in history class versus, you know, in science class. So it's really fast and easy to write. And Taylor had a really good idea with her color coding. Group your concepts together. Doesn't necessarily have to be color coded, but like put some kind of like big circle thing or some kind of bracket, something to say, hey, these concepts go together. And these concepts go together. Because that'll help your brain tie down those anchor points later and help you get it into your long-term memory. Because when you're coming up with those concepts, you're actually doing higher-level thinking that makes you rehearse the information further. It's called evaluation. It's at the very top of Bloom's taxonomy. You need to do this while you're in lecture. You need to be able to flip back and forth between that and this and figure out what's the most important thing for you to get in your notes. Because the purpose of taking notes is to have a record of what happened during the lecture so you can study it and put it in your long-term memory later. Another thing, this is a really nice system of notes that you should, really, you should use this. <coughs> you look at some of your papers and you're pretty close. Some people's papers, some people's notes get kind of crazy. I still, well, actually, I was left here last year, I found this student, took notes, pretty good organized notes, just pass these ones around the room and you can, but you can, well, I'm just going to hold it up. But you can see, she's like filled the whole page. What if she had to add something? What if she needed to like tie in a previous concept? Post the notes. Post the notes. Just stick them all over there and hope they don't fall off. Glue them down and hope that whatever's under it isn't important. <laughs> this is a really good style of notes. You may have heard of it. It's called the Cornell system of taking notes. This is what I would do. Like take some of your notes. No, seriously, this is, this is a great system. And we're going to use it this year. And I'll, I'll tell you when. But here's how it would look. You take your paper, I did this with a ruler so it's pretty close to exact. You leave six inches from where you're writing, and then like two and a half to three inches over here. It would look like this. So you squeeze your nose in there, you just take your notes like you normally take notes in this area right here. All right? And then over in this area right here, this is where you can put your questions, this is where you can put like your comments, like tie it in. Anytime you can tie something you're learning to like your actual like life situation is going to help you remember it better. So you can be like, oh yeah, it's just like Uncle Freddie said, you know, never poop where you eat. Uh, I'm just, I don't know. Don't, you shouldn't do that, that's bad. See, I'm holding it for the cameras. But what else is good? is I rely heavily on asking questions. Sometimes you'll be writing stuff, and you're writing stuff, and you don't even understand it. You just sit there, and you're like, oh, I should ask him about that, but then, you know, you can't. You've got space, dedicated space, where you can write down your questions. You've got dedicated space where you can practice, you can rehearse, you can write the key term of the definition, 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 key term of the definition. Because that's going to get in your long term memory. So you can remember it. In science, in science, graph paper is always good. You can do the same thing on graph paper. And then it makes like this nice, look at this, this is awesome. You can get this like in a whole composition book for like $2 at Walmart. Nice big paper. You got all this area here. When you flip it over, you can still see the line through there really well. Right, so you can put your stuff over here. This is just something I'm going to have you guys use. 
while you're watching the videos, here's the deal. While you're watching the videos, because anybody can come and say, yeah, I watched the video. Maybe you did, maybe you didn't. You gotta show me. I'm science. This is all about evidence, right, Cody? Yeah. All about evidence. So after you're supposed to watch a video, the next day you're gonna come in, you're gonna get out your notes, but I want you to use the Cornell system, at least for the flip class video, because what I need you guys to do, you have your notes, but I want you to ask at least two questions over here in this area. It'll be more useful for you if you link them like right where it goes. You guys can probably see on these notes here, I'll kind of ban and white it around. You see that I highlighted them. You see, she's got this area. <coughs> we'll look, bio notes. These would probably be useful. She's got this area up here where I see there's like questions up at the top. So maybe, I mean, I, I hate to tell you, like, you must use this system of note taking that I decided is better for everyone. It's, this is going to be better for the majority of you. But you need to have some kind of dedicated area where your questions can go where I can easily see them. Does that make sense? The way you used to do it last year is probably saw the Moodle thing up there. They used to do this whole like Moodle forum thing, and they'd like get in there and they'd like make their like post, and they'd ask two questions about the video, and then we had like a good question and answer thing going on. The problem is like people would ask a few questions, they'd be good questions that need to be answered, and then they'd never go look at it again. And we didn't have enough time in class to so, like okay, we're gonna have a Moodle time. Everybody get on the Moodle, you know, because there's a lot of good info there. So that being said, if you're like, no, I have to know right now, the Moodle has a ton of questions below those videos that are embedded with a bunch of answers, a bunch of discussion. It's good. But I'm going to try this instead, where, but preferably this. You take your notes, write your two questions, I'm going to check these, that's how you're going to get your I watch to the video points. Now we're going to make it a little flexible, because already, like, as a student, like, that would tick me off. I hated being told to take notes. Especially, like, as I got to your age, I'm already like, listen, I know when I need to take notes. Why don't you tell me when I need to take notes? I'll take notes when I need to take notes. Get them up off my stuff. Because I had a little like oppositional defiance thing going on when I was a teenager. So I'll give you the option. You can either do the notes, or there'll be like five to maybe ten-ish like focus questions. You can answer those questions while you're watching the video. Give you something to do, and it's questions like they'll be based on the video. Does that make sense, everybody? Now I'm a realist, and I know some kids are just going to Google up those answers. I know some kids are just going to grab somebody's notes and copy them real quick. You know, you do what you got to do, but the trade-off of points for the learning is not equitable. This will hurt you more in the long run than that. And by that, I mean actually watch you. Does that make sense to everybody? Yes, no, maybe? You need to show me something, either notes or answers to those focus questions. I'll put some kind of stamp thing on them that says, yeah, you did it. And then you'll keep those, you'll turn them in when you come to the test. That way you've got them always so you can study, use them to do your homework, use them to do your... Work. Does that make sense, everybody? Which means, which means if you just have all these loose papers and you lose them, you're not going to get any points even if you saw, like even if I saw when you did it. So what you need is uh, some kind of blah, 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 blah. That's just more of the same. Yeah, click for me. Come up with some way to organize your notes so it doesn't look like this. Just a jumbled pile of papers falling out of a folder. Where'd that binder go? Where'd that end up? It's over here somewhere. This what happened to This is a good idea. Having one of these for each of your classes for science, I'd, rec I'd highly recommend getting a graph paper one. And then also you guys are like, oh, right, because on the tests you have to write a graph paper. You might as well get used to it now. Or what else works really well, the three ring binder. Here's a real nice one for like all these tabbies and things. Go crazy. I have a bunch of these, so if you're like, no, I want a three-ring binder, but I cannot afford the dollar fifty at Walmart for a three-ring binder, just tell me and I will give you a three-ring binder. I have the janitors steal them out of kids' lockers at the end of the year, like when they leave all their stuff behind. I have like 50 of them. Does that make sense, everybody? Yes, no, maybe? Yeah. All right. I want to go back a couple slides. Hold on. Go to, yeah, that, that, the beware slide. Yeah. Nice. All right. So the beware slide. Just real quickly, just to reinforce your note taking. All right. Don't listen only for facts because you're not going to be like, oh, I'm just going to listen for when they say names and dates and history. I'm going to write those down. It's not going to help you. Shoot for your main ideas. Get for your concepts. I saw a lot of you guys writing in like an outline format. You should try and get away from that because unless the 
like speaker is speaking from a well-guided outline, it's not going to give you the flexibility. You see what I'm saying? Now you can sort of get around that even if you do the bullets, if you do the Cornell style, you can sort of get around because you've got all this area over here for linking and doing notes and stuff like that. But you want to try and shift away from those bullet points like, you know, basically copying a PowerPoint. I'm, I'm telling you, it will not serve you for very long. Even if it's worth, for some of you, it's not going to work this year. For most of you, it's not going to work even three years from now. And try to get away from that system.